open our Bibles to John chapter 1. And if you don't have a Bible and would like one to follow along, raise your hand and we'll get a Bible in your hands. All right. John chapter 1, beginning on verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now scroll down to verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let us pray. Lord, this morning we open our hearts to you. Lord, we open uh, all ourselves to your truth and your word. Lord, right now we just ask that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear, Lord. Lord, lead us through the Holy Spirit what exactly it is that you want us to take away from your word, Lord, as we go home and we celebrate your son, Lord. In the glorious name of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Lord, freshly fill us with your Holy Spirit, and we ask for your understanding. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. John, the son of Zebedee, was the author of the Gospel of John, who gave his testimony of the ministry of Jesus Christ from his personal relationship with him. John was one of the 12 disciples who was called by Jesus to follow him. And John followed Jesus throughout his ministry all the way to his death, burial, and resurrection. But as John could begin uh, his gospel in many ways, he begins by describing who Jesus is and what he has done. He points the readers to the deity of Jesus. And he starts with, in the beginning. He takes the readers way back, going as far back as they could even think to that point of time that is just before the beginning of a duration. And what John is referring to is the timeless eternity of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God. Before God created the heavens and the earth, he points us to this place and says, in the beginning was the word. Because John is referring, as you, if you notice, the word is capitalized. And he's referring to the name or a title of a being who is God's revelation. And John uses this name, this word, to describe who this being is. He is the word, who is the verbal echo of the verb's meaning to speak. In the beginning, he was the spoken word of the Father. And then John says, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And with this statement, John sets forth one of the most basic foundations of our faith, the Holy Trinity. Now, let's follow John's logic here. He says, in the beginning, speaking of eternity, there is an eternal being known as the Word because he was at the beginning. This being is God because he is called God. And at the same time, the Word is a distinct person as the Father is a distinct person from the Word because the Word was with God. Therefore, the image John is painting for us is that the Father and the Word are God. They are distinctly different persons, yet they are equally God. And with them comes the person of God, the Holy Spirit, as we know. And we understand these three to be one God and three persons. Or as the whole Testament calls them in the beginning, God, Elohim. El meaning singular as one, Ohim meaning more than one of the same. One God and three persons, our blessed Trinity. Now, why did I start or decided to start here for our Christmas message? Well, I believe it is important to understand who the Word is and where He came from before we try to understand the significance of the beautiful birth that occurred one holy night in Bethlehem that has impacted all of our lives 2,000 years later. The Word was with the Father before our time began. Before the creation, he was with the Father in the presence of his glory. 
And he left the glory of the Father's presence. He left the joy and the peace of heaven to come and dwell among us. John says, and the word became flesh, dwelt among us. Now in the Old Testament, God appeared to mankind in a variety of but limited kind of ways. Revealing his presence to man, he came by a voice from a cloud, a burning bush. He came through visions and through dreams. And then his presence would be centered in the tabernacle and later on in the temple where he was seen in a cloud of glory known as the Shekinah glory. So God dwelled among his people in a variety of ways, although it was limited. But when he sent his son, Jesus, God the Father showed himself in a much more personal way. The word would be sent to the world and become flesh. There was this young, pure girl by the name of Mary who found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And God chose her to birth his son into the world. And so he sent, as we've heard the the story, his angel Gabriel to her. And the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? She had never been with a man physically. She was a virgin. But she was betrothed, meaning she was promised to Joseph for marriage, or as we call it, she was engaged. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. So God has sent his messenger to deliver his message to Mary, And her response to the angel was, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. So she conceived a child, and as months passed, Mary was near giving birth. And a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all should, you know, all the world should go and register, and everyone was to go to their home city and register. And so Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was also of the lineage of David. And she was with child, so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And so she goes into labor. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. So Jesus was born into the world in the flesh. And this is where I believe the Lord had led me to stop and behold where the word became flesh. He wanted us to look at the incarnation of God, meaning to be embodied, that God the Son was born into this world, taken on human flesh, leaving eternity and entering into time and became a part of the world that he created in the beginning. Now, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, but in Jesus, the word became a visible picture of God. Martin Luther stated, the mystery of the humanity of Christ that he sunk himself into our flesh is beyond all human understanding. I agree. In other words, what happened in the world and for this world that night, when the word who was at the beginning became flesh, is much more than any one of us could ever understand combined. But here he laid the word in the flesh, a baby birthed of a woman wrapped in swaddling cloths in a major, the only begotten son of God, who left the presence again of his father's glory. Now think about that. Think about that. He came from the presence of his father's glory to the most humblest of places to be born, It wasn't even fit for a king, a manger where they keep animals. And he was placed in a feeding trough 
full of hay, a place that was fit for a lamb. I can only imagine how Joseph and Mary anticipated his arrival. As we all would, think, you know, thinking, what will our child look like? Or maybe even beyond that, what will the Son of God look like? When a child is born, nothing else matters to us. You know, that's happening around the world. Because our lives are fixed on that beautiful life that was born. So tiny and so small. Your heart just melts at every moment and every sound. It's that instant love we have for our child. The tears of joy and the tears of happiness finally seeing our baby. Now, I remember when my first child was born. Seeing her come into the world changed my life forever. I went from acting like an immature boy to being an instant father. I wanted to protect her and give her everything that she needed to make sure nothing happens to her. She melted my heart as I studied every inch of her. At her tiny feet, at her tiny fingers, she was beautiful. They were so small but perfectly designed. I listened to her cry, her unique cry, and then I would see her respond to my voice as I told her, Daddy loves you. I could not take my eyes off of her. And this was the same for each and one of my kids that were born. I studied every inch of them. And here we got Mary and Joseph. They're just like us in this room. I believe they both studied baby Jesus with tears of joy and happiness. But here this birth was like no other. Mary had given birth, bringing into this world the Son of God, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords, the Prince of peace, Emmanuel, God with us, and most of all, our Savior, who was foretold in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. He says, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, he says, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. Now, can you imagine as they're sitting there looking at their child, if this verse crossed Mary and Joseph's mind, realizing this day prophecy had been fulfilled through his birth. So many things could have been running through their minds. So many questions. I mean, what was Joseph thinking about when he was staring at this wonder? In the Nativity movie, I loved it. Uh, the character Joseph said to Mary as he stared at Jesus, I wonder if there's anything I will be able to teach him. That is a le legit statement. But I believe just as most of us who have children, Mary and Joseph, stared at their newborn, they studied every inch of him from his little head to his tiny toes, just looking at him and adoring him, holding his head as it fit in the palm of their hand. And as they gazed at him, I wondered if it crossed their mind, when he is able to speak, will every word that come out of his little lips be the living word of God? What will he teach us even as a child? What will he reveal to us? Well, John, he shares a lot of what Jesus had to say during his ministry, but points his readers to the seven unique statements in his gospel where Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though that he may die, he shall live. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. One of the most interesting statements I would, I would fail you guys if I didn't put in here was when Jesus stood before Pilate. And Jesus would answer Pilate's question, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born. And for this cause I I have come into the world that I should bear witness of the truth. Everyone who is of the truth, he hears my voice. And as Mary and Joseph stared at him, looking at his tiny eyes, 
did it cross their minds in that moment that they were staring at the eyes of the Lord? I couldn't imagine them saying to one another, well, I could. Will he see things that we can't see? Will he be able to see these things that we can't see? Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 19, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. They had no idea that his eyes would see the Samaritan woman at the well who would go in the middle of the day to draw water when no one else was there because she was the talk of the town. He would see her and would ask her to give him a drink of water at Jacob's well from a lady who had five husbands and the one whom she was living with now wasn't her husband. He sees her and he reveals that truth in her life. And yet the father through Jesus, would reveal to her that his son, Jesus, is the Messiah who speaks to her. Here's your Messiah that I promised you unto the world. And he gave her hope. She needed to change her life, and he gave her that hope. Mary and Joseph had no idea that his eyes would see the lame man sitting at the pool of Bethesda, who had been lame for 38 years and had given up. Jesus sees him, and he goes to him and would ask him, do you want to be made well? After the lame man's reply, there's no one here to help him. Every time the water stirred up, everyone beats him into the water before he can. And Jesus would tell him, the man, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And the lame man, after 38 years, got up, and he took up his bed and walked. And as Mary and Joseph continued to study their little child, they looked at his tiny little ears and maybe wondered, what things will he be able to hear? Will he be able to hear things or sounds that we can't hear? Well, Jesus spoke of these things that he hears in John chapter 8, verse 26. He said, he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him, speaking of the Father. Their baby's tiny ears would listen to the very voice of God the Father. And he would speak the very words the Father had spoken to him. And his words would be spoken with such authority. As we stop and behold this newborn child, as we think of his mind, as we see his eyes and, and we look at his ears and his mouth and all that God would be doing through his son, it is more than enough to try to take in in these thoughts alone. But then there Eyes move to his chest, breathing in air and breathing out. You ever seen your child just, you just stare at them when they breathe and you see that little rising and that descending? Did they realize that he is one who breathed life into Adam? And here he is breathing in air for himself. And then they would see the rhythm of his heartbeat in between his breaths, taking in that they are witnessing the very heartbeat of God in, in just this little chest. They may have thought, what will his heart be like? Will he have the heart of a warrior king, strong with courageous faith? Will he be merciful? Will he have a heart of compassion? But little did they know their baby would reveal the true love of the father and that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This day was so important that the father and the angels, they stood in silence to witness the birth of Jesus. The father watched knowing why his son was born. The son was the promised gift of salvation, the Savior. And as a father myself, and I'm sure I speak for a lot of parents in this room, I can't even begin to imagine the heart of the father here seeing his son born, knowing the reasons he was born and what he will face in his life to save the world from their sins. And we're talking about the cross God sent his son because he loved the world. This love is greater than we can even fathom as we behold baby Jesus this Christmas, being born in the flesh. We need to remember this day is the day the Father revealed him to everyone in the world. Right here in this very scene, wrapped in swaddling cloths in a manger, for whosoever believes in his son will not perish but have everlasting life. This is the very reason his son was sent into this world. What Mary and Joseph were seeing was just a small glimpse of his love. But to the world, as we read, 
we would learn that the love of God through him is greater than we could ever imagine. And as Mary and Joseph, they stared at the movement of his chest cavities, they see his arms and they see his hands move. And mama grabs hold of his tiny fingers as they move. That's like the first thing when, I, when my children were born, I wanted to touch their hand, their fingers. They're so tiny and beautiful. And maybe mama just asked herself, how will he use these hands? Will he, you know, take after his father Joseph and become a carpenter? Or will he use those hands to rule on his throne? They had no idea that his arms and hands and fingers would reach out to a man who fell to his face before Jesus and implored the Lord, saying, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And this man was full of leprosy and hadn't had a physical touch or any acceptance of the society around him for a long time because of his leprosy. And yet, Jesus, filled with compassion and love, reached out to him and used his hands to touch him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately, the leprosy left him. Mary had no idea that his hands would take dirt from the ground, that he would mix with his saliva and anoint the eyes of a blind man with the clay he made and would tell the blind man, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And that blind man would go and wash out that clay and he would come back seeing. As Joseph and Mary began to look at his feet, they may have wondered, where will his little feet take him? Having no idea that his feet would bring him to a town where a woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. And she suffered many things from many physicians and she never got better. But as soon as she heard that about Jesus, she came behind him as he walked through a crowd and she reached for him and touched his garment saying, if I only may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And immediately the fountain of blood of her blood was dried up. And she felt her body that she was healed of the affliction. <laughs> Mary and Joseph would never imagine that these same little feet that Jesus would walk on would one day walk on water across the Sea of Galilee to his disciples. Now, when they saw him, of course, they kind of freaked out and said, it's a ghost, you know. But Jesus said to them, be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. As Mary and Joseph continued to study and adore their newborn son, there was much to wonder about Jesus, the Son of God. So many questions running through their minds, even trying to understand the deeper meaning of his name, Jesus. Yahweh is salvation. That was given to them by the angel Gabriel. Will he save them from the Roman captivity and usher in the new kingdom and rule as a lion forevermore? According to the scriptures, well, yeah, he will. But they didn't know at this moment that this was his first coming and that their beautiful newborn son would be the unblemished sacrificial lamb of God. Their child that laid in that trough before them and for the whole world to see would reveal how great the father's love is, the, the father's compassion is, and the father's grace is for the world, for us in this room here this morning. The birth of our Lord Jesus Christ that happened 2,000 years ago is what we are looking at this Christmas. It's what we are celebrating, but our eyes want us to keep, or the Lord wants to keep our eyes on the child. What this birth means, that the word became flesh. He was born in the flesh to save you from the death of your sin. This baby would grow and become the Christ, the Messiah, our Savior, and his body, the body that we've been examining, would one day grow. And he would be beaten beyond measure with you on his heart and on his mind. He would be mocked while they pressed a crown of thorns on his head. His body would bear the weight of the cross that he carries for you. His mouth that spoke God's truth would be bruised and dry. While his whipped body and legs bared the weight of that heavy wooden cross. And then his hands, those tiny hands that Joseph and Mary held, would be pierced with nails. And his precious feet would be pierced, being nailed to a cross. And he, the Lamb of God, born in a manger, would be lifted up on the cross at Calvary. With his eyes and his ears fixated on his Father, but with you 
on his heart and on his mind. And he will ask the Father on our behalf, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And as the sin of the world fell upon the Lamb of God, your sin, my sin, all sin fell upon him. And Jesus would then declare, it is finished. And would die on the cross, and then he would be buried in a tomb, but would rise from the grave on the third day. And Mary had no idea that the mother of Jesus would be there through it all for him, while Joseph may have passed long before. They had no idea that their baby was born to endure all that he would, and that one day he would ascend back to the Father in heaven and be seated at the right hand of his Father, and that it would stand 2,000 years, 2,000 years up to today as a finished work which he is the foundation of all Christian peace and faith through what he did. He paid in full the debt we righteously owe to God. For all those who call upon his name, the name of Jesus shall be saved and will enter into a personal relationship with God. As Mary and Joseph looked upon their newborn son that Christmas night, they had no idea what the Son of God would do even in their lives. They were simply being faithful and trusting in God for what he had entrusted in them, the Son. And yet, they would receive for themselves the gift of salvation from their newborn child. Our first Christmas at this fellowship, we talked about the promised gift of our Savior and how God is faithful to his word. But this year, I felt the Lord wanted us to just look at him and behold him at his birth to look at the incarnation of our Lord Jesus, the embodied Son of God in the flesh, but to look at him through the eyes of Mary and Joseph and also through the eyes of God the Father. His birth was nothing short of a miracle. So this morning is of a celebration of a blessed birthday, for unto us a child is born, a son is given. Now, in closing, before we, we get to the end of this message, Right. What I love about John's gospel is that he said that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And I want you to note that John uses the word beheld because it is stronger than the words saw or looked. John tells us in this verse that he and the other disciples they carefully studied, they watched him, they looked at him, they observed everything about him for some time. They beheld Jesus. So he's basically saying, I saw his glory, the glory belonging to the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And this is the heart of the message to behold Jesus at his birth. And that we truly understand who he is and what he's done for us that he is the eternal word who was at the beginning, the son of God who became flesh over 2,000 years ago. This day was the day a baby was born in Bethlehem. And although Mary and Joseph may have only saw him as their newborn baby at that time, we rejoice as we see him as the perfect gift of salvation, the savior of the world, and not only that, but the savior of our own personal lives. That through him, we have entered into a beautiful relationship with God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. To God be the glory, amen. All to say, if you're not a Christian or not walking with the Lord, I'll ask you first, what are you waiting for? And if you're not walking with the Lord, what are you doing? All you need to do is believe in him through faith, that he is the word who became flesh, the Son of God, and that he died, was buried, and rose again on the third day. And ask him to forgive you for your sin. And he will forgive you. And will come into your heart through the power of the Holy Spirit. And you will pass from death to life eternally. This is why this day is so important for mankind and for you. This is why he was born as the Holy Lamb of God. And for that we are forever grateful. We are forever grateful, and we rejoice in Christ the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. 
Lord, we behold your son. To look at him from head to toe, Lord. And how you would use him to glorify you, Lord. That through him, people will see you. And Lord, as we are walking with, with you, Lord, we pray that through us, everyone would see Jesus. Lord, that we may reflect him, Lord, that all would come to him, Lord, and that they would be able to celebrate and understand this day that we celebrate. Lord, we rejoice. We're so thankful for your son, Jesus. We're so thankful that he stepped out of heaven, Lord, just to take on flesh, Lord, and to teach us what holiness looks like for our own lives. We thank you for the Holy Spirit for empowering us, the, the, the ability to walk in him. And Lord, we just ask, Lord, that you be with us this week as we enter this season of giving, Lord, for you have given the greatest gift above all, just like uh, Molly had said. And so, Lord, we, we lift up the name of Jesus to you, and we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you need any prayer and would like to pray with someone, we'll be up here up front for you to pray with you. So if you could, please stand with me. And sing with me. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him. Born the King of angels, O oh, come, let us adore him. O oh, come, let us adore him. O oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. God bless you all and Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm.